Hello and welcome to I'll Knit If I Want To. I'm Andrea Mowry of Drea Renee Knits and this is where I ask, nope, I don't ask, you ask and I answer some of your questions. And today I am so cozy. I've just maxed out on my cozy. I am wearing the Weekender Crew, complete with pockets, the Traveler Cowl, both of these are knit out of my hand spun yarn, and I treated myself to a little time at the sewing machine yesterday. I don't think I have made anything at my sewing machine in almost a year. I think the last thing I made was a sweatshirt for Spicy Pete. So I just got a little bee in my bonnet. I have been wanting to make a pair of sweatpants for I can't tell you how long, and so I did it. So unfortunately, you are not even going to be able to see how cute these really are. I could even do like a little... Well, little French tuck. Um, but the cutest part is actually down here, which you can't really see. But they have these cute little front pleat in the leg. So I don't know about you, but I have never successfully purchased a pair of cozy sweatpants from a store. I don't know who they're making them for, but it's not me. <laughs> and so I've had this idea forever. As I said, these are the berry pants. And I love them. I, I swear I have like a Pavlovian response to when I start this podcast and all of a sudden I'm like I'm thirsty and my hands and my lips are dry. <laughs> um, I've shown this before. This is a hand cream I love. This is Utopia Bath Limited and it's this scent called Silver Birch and Willow. I'll tell you what, that is something special. But okay, so I love the berry pants. I'm sure I've talked about them on here before because I have made them, I don't know how many times, in all different kinds of fabrics. I They're from Style Arc. And before that, I made the bob pants. The bob pants are kind of the original iteration of these. And I find that people seem to either love the bob or the berry. I'm definitely team berry. The berry pants, they added this little front pleat pleat no dart dart to like the near the cuff and oh my goodness it just accentuates these have kind of a half moon shaped leg and that little dart helps accentuate it I mean I have actually altered my like ready to wear clothing I've bought to include this little leg shape because I love it so much I've done it to a few pairs of overalls and yeah anyways I'm so excited. They turned out great. So great that I actually started with this. This was all stash fabric. And you know, when you are influenced by friends and their color palette that works so well for them, and then you're like, I love that color. You make me want to use that color. And then you get it and you're like, this is not my color. So this toffee color, I love, especially my friend, Annie Rowden. She's one of those people that looks great in a toffee and so I look at a toffee and I want to be able to do the toffee but it's not really a color that lights me up I'm not super excited about it so anyways I do like these I'm super happy with them I will wear them all the time but I am more of a navy a blue kind of girl and I also happen to have a bunch of stashed navy sweatshirt material from when I made spicy Pete sweatshirt so I'm gonna do that. Hopefully today, if I get all my work done, I'm gonna try and at least cut out my navy pair. And then I'm gonna have a twin set because I already have a navy sweatshirt I made myself last year. I'm sure I've worn it on here before, but I'm pretty tickled with myself. Um, so anyways, it has been so fun to get back to my sewing machine. Um, if you've been hanging out here for a while, you know that my list of things that I like to do is always growing. <laughs> <laughs> and like not just growing but also the things that I love to do are spicy Pete's trying to call me right now I'm gonna see if I can send him a text from my iPad dooby dabby do um but also with all of those crafts I feel like I'm um getting in deeper with all of them where I 
I'm going like further and further. So instead of just knitting, I'm taking it a step further by wanting to spin the yarn and then do the knitting. And then I took it a step further by being like, well, before I spin the yarn, I want to prep the fiber right off the sheet. <laughs> you know? So I feel like I'm like doing these levels. I would love to weave fabric to then sew into clothing, but I'm, I'm not, I'm not quite there yet. Anyways, so it's hard to fit in time for all the things. So it felt really good to just remember, like I've, I've have said this and been wanting to it for so long where I want to set up my weekly schedule in a way that I'm like weaving Wednesdays, sewing Saturdays, <laughs> spinning Sundays, knitting's every day. That's just a given. Uh, but I would love to, even if it's just like one hour, you know, in the evening after my kids have gone to bed or in the morning before everyone's gotten up, just to be able to keep all of these things I love, like carve out a little bit of space for them because it can be hard to juggle it all. Anyways, I just went off on a whole tangent and we haven't even really started. <laughs> Okay, so as I said, I'm wearing the Weekender Crew and the Traveler Cowl. I will link both of these below as well as the pants pattern because I do often get asked what sewing patterns I like. Little caveat, so I have found for both the Bob and the Berry, and maybe this is just style arc patterns in general, they assume a certain level of sewing knowledge for each of their patterns. They are not hold your hand patterns. So if you are a new sewist, I would start with maybe some indie designer patterns such as So Liberated's really great. Um, I've had great luck with Friday Pattern Co. Um, Vivian Shao Chen has some great patterns. Anyways, I find that indie sewing patterns are a little more beginner friendly pattern friendly beginner sewist friendly especially so liberated they will even do video help sometimes they even do online workshops that you can sign up for and it's like a sew along and they help you through the whole thing so anyways good place to start i think the berry pants i mean i can knock these out like there's no tomorrow now that i've done them they just assume you know you need to finish your edges and your seams and things like that without saying it in the pattern. So if you're brand new, you're going to be like, um, <laughs> what? So anyways, but once you have tried, um, some patterns are a little more detailed. I think they are, these ones are really, really great. Okay. Let's actually jump into what this podcast is about with some questions that you sent in and I'm going to try my best to answer them. So question number one, Andrea, please help. My dog got to my precious flicker and flame hat that I love and wear all the time. She chewed a big hole cutting across the main color and contrast color, but it's near the top. I'm trying to figure out how to save it. I have leftover yarn for both colors, so I'm thinking to just cut into the top just below the damage and knit the end of the hat again. I'm assuming I'll be able to figure out where to pick up the chart to make the color work continuous, but any tips, advice you have to rescue this hat and problems with this approach. Thanks so much for considering my question. So I am just going to quickly search now that I'm thinking about this. I wonder, I'm trying to see if my old blog is still out in the world. Um, so, ah, it is. Okay. I'll, I'm going to peek through there. So yes, I would try exactly what you're saying. And here are some things to consider. When, what I would try and do is I would take a needle, probably smaller than what you knit that hat on. I don't know if you did the sport or the worsted weight, but I would go down even smaller. You could even use like a sock needle, um, like a size one or two, just cause it's a little easier to get through those live stitches. And what I would do is I would try to feed that needle before you've unraveled or done anything. I would try and go around the circumference of that hat, going through every other 
leg of a stitch so that you're going in through every knit stitch. So like you're gonna see all these V's like this and so you're gonna go in through every other leg like that. Does that make sense? I feel like I'm overcomplicating it. Just try and run your needle through every stitch um, and get them onto that and then I would unravel the top of the hat. Then from there, I would grab your needle that you actually need to work from and I would undo a row. And what you're trying to do is get yourself so you're on all the same round. That's actually gonna be maybe a little bit of the tricky bit is trying to stay on the same round. It can be really easy when you're trying to get a needle back in there to either miss some stitches or to end up having some of your stitches from the row above and then the row below and just trying to get to a really solid base again. Um, and then from there, once you feel like you are at a stable place, if you can even try to find your beginning of round, it actually shouldn't be too hard because you should be able to look at the inside of the hat and see where you carried your colors up. So that's what I would look for and try to get really close to that beginning of round. And then I would go through once you feel like you've got a solid foundation back on your needles, I would then look at the stitches on your needles and try and match those up with the chart to figure out which row you're on. But I definitely think you could do it. Um, years and years and years ago, I lived in New Zealand and my partner at the time, I had knit them hand knit socks and they put them on our wood printing stove to try to dry them and burned a big hole into one of those socks. So I actually put ran a small needle through above and below that burn mark, cut out the burn mark, re-knit that area and then grafted it together. And it worked out really well. Um, but I do remember accidentally picking up a stitch like from this round and then one below, like it can just be kind of hard to tell because when we work in the round, we're really working on a spiral. So hey, you can just accidentally pick up from the wrong, from the wrong row. Um, so just being careful about that. House of blast from the past. Anyways, oh, wow. I didn't realize I was still posting on here back when um, we had our baby. Okay, so I'm just seeing if I can Wow. I'm gonna have to I'm gonna have to do a deep dive. But I'm gonna stop distracting myself with this and get back to the next question. So best of luck, I think you'll do great. Next question is I started learning how to spin on a support spindle in October and I'm having so much fun learning something new after knitting for almost 20 years. Um, now I'm curious to know more about the different types of fiber prep, Rolex, comb top, etc., and their difference, as well as your take on different types of spinning. I am considering drop spindles and even a wheel. What would you use each one for? Okay, so let's start with a little bit of fiber prep and what we might want to achieve with that fiber prep. So when it comes to, let's take the first two that you mentioned, which would be a Rolag or comb top. So Rolags I have shown on here before. I know I have one. Here we go. This is a Rolag. So this is a little tube of fiber and you spin off of the end. I want it to focus on there. Still trying to get me such a stinker. I'm going to go right here. Focus on my hand. Anyways, you spin off the end and what happens is it creates a tube. So this is really, really ideal for when you want to spin a loftier yarn that has some air in it. So it's great for long draw or double drafting, um, which I like to definitely use either on my Saxony style wheel, which I would consider like a Cinderella wheel, where the big drive wheels kind of off to the side a little bit. It's, it sits sideways to you. Unlike a castle wheel, which also is right in front of you, it's kind of a more compact design. So I like to do long draw or woolen style spinning, whether that be long draw, supported long draw, double drafting, all those kinds of things, um, either on my Saxony Cinderella sideways kind of style wheel or on my support spindles. So a spindle like this, 
that you set down onto something and spin it supported so it's not hanging in the air like a drop spindle. So that's how I like to do my more woolen style yarns, which is gonna give you a very lofty, light as air, because they're full of air, kind of a yarn. These yarns are gonna be very warm and insulating, um, but they're not gonna be quite as hard wearing as a worsted style yarn, which has the air compressed out of it and is really smoothed down as you prep it. That's a little more hard wearing, great for socks. Um, so it kind of depends what you want to use that yarn for, where you're going to make these decisions. So that's a roll lag. Other woolen preps, and I'm going to just go ahead and preface this by saying, we all know I'm not a spinning instructor. I'm also what I would call a very intuitive spinner. So there are going to be people out there that are much more technical spinners that are going to believe fully that you cannot spin a woolen yarn unless it is a true woolen prep, same for worsted, where I'm like, <laughs> I'll just call this a woolen style, you know, um, it's all yarn, um, but different things will achieve different results. So I'm just speaking from what, how I like to do it. It's, you may find it different for you. Comb top is more what we get when we see a braid which I think I might have a little bump of a braid right here. No, no, hold on, yes I do. Okay, so this, oh, my, my crinkling, this is comb top. So this is when you see those really pretty braids um, that are dyed and in these fiber preps, typically we are going to see that the fiber is all aligned in the same in the same way. They're all kind of in order. Unlike a woolen prep, which could be a roll egg, but it could also be a bat or carded, and that's or pin drafted, I believe. And that's when those fibers are gonna be more jumbled up. They're not all facing the same way. So you would typically wanna use a woolen prep for woolen spinning and a worsted prep for worsted spinning. Worsted spinning is when we do like a short forward motion. I prefer to do worsted style spinning at my castle style wheel, which is when the drive wheel is right in front of me, everything's right in front of me, or on a drop spindle. Those are the tools I would choose to spin that way. I will also say though, I will, I have mixed up, you know, using a woolen prep and still drafting at worsted to come up with a semi-woolen or a semi-worsted yarn. Um, so, you know, the world's your oyster, try, experiment. I love to experiment with spinning. I like to see what I'm gonna get and how that's gonna react. I think that is half the fun of spinning. Um, so, I have talked about some different preps. And there's lots of different preps, but there's the couple that you asked about. Um, and I kind of covered what I would use each one for. So it's so fun. And there's so much to it. You could go on, you could find the one way that you love to spin a default yarn and you could just keep on that train for as long as it's bringing you joy, or you could try and learn all the different styles. I mean, I know people who the technical stuff is what excites them. So they love to play around with learning the technical side of things. And then there's other people who are like, I just wanna make yarn and I just love it. And I don't even need to do anything with the yarn. The yarn is my final art form. I just wanna spin to make yarn. So, um, Whatever, whatever fills your bucket. But generally speaking, I like to use supports and Saxony style wheel for my long draw or woolen prep kind of spinning. And I like to use drop spindles and my castle wheel for worsted style spinning. Um, none of those are hard and fast rolls. And there you go. All right. Ooh, I thought this is a great one, especially when we're midwinter uh, and we'll someday be heading into spring, at least where I live. So my question is about washing your knits between uses or at the end of the season. Do you wash multiple things together? Yes, I do. Like, can I fill my tub, add wool wash and put several knits in once, in at once? 
Um, I'd probably toss in a color grabber if I question bleeding of any of the items, but it's like, if I'm gonna do the work, can I do it all at once? Yes. So I would 100% avoid anything that you think will bleed. If I, I wouldn't even try the color catcher in hopes that that would save the situation. If you do think there's something in there that's gonna bleed, that would be the one thing I would wash by itself or with things that can't, that I don't think will pick up that color. But in general, if I do think it's gonna bleed, that gets washed all by itself. But everything else, like I keep my hand knit socks, I have quite a few pairs. So when one needs washing out, I just put it next to the tub in my laundry room where I wash my woolens. And once I am gonna wash other things, I always throw the socks in there so I can wash those at the same time. Um, so I all the time, wash multiple woolens at once, especially because I wear a lot of woolens. Um, and as far as washing knits between uses or at the end of the season, it's really dependent on you and your knit. Does it need to be washed before the end of the season? I definitely wash my sweaters every few wears, depending on if they need it. I mean, I I wear my sweaters just like I would wear any of my other clothing. So there are times like I, I cook a lot. So a lot of times I'm not, I, I always say to myself, I should wear an apron <laughs> and then I never do. So a lot of times I do need to wash my sweaters. Um, it's pretty rare that I wouldn't wash something I've worn for the whole season. Um, but I definitely think it's really smart to make sure at the very least, let's say you wore one of your sweaters once and it's, not like it's dirty and so you didn't wash it, but if you're gonna pack it away for spring and summer, 100% wash it before you do that because there's a good chance that even if it doesn't feel dirty, smell dirty, all these things, you have still shed skin cells and things like that into the sweater and that is what moths are attracted to. So just to avoid any chance of attracting our little beastie friends, um, I would make sure to wash. It's always, always, always a good rule of thumb to wash before storing for the season. Um, I also heard of another knitter who will bring all their woolens out like onto their porch in the spring and let them hang out in the sunshine for a day or two, you know, bring them in at night. But moths don't like light. So by really exposing your sweaters to light before storage and after when you go to bring them back out for the next season is a great idea. Okay. I took my finished DRK everyday sweater out of hiding today and wore it out of the house. I forgot how much I love it. I've noticed that since Gertrude, my mannequin, has been wearing it, the neckline has more of a tendency to pull lower than I like. Do you think I could crochet around the neckline to reinforce it or would it be better to use elastic? I love the length of the neckline so I don't really want to fold it over to funnel elastic through. Thanks for your help. So one thing I would try is just reblocking your sweater. There's a good chance that your mannequin and gravity maybe cause that neckline to open up more than you would like it to if you basically had it stored on your mannequin since the last time you wore it. I would throw it in the tub, pat it back into the correct dimensions using your schematic, let it dry, and it might be problem fixed. Um, we always wanna be careful leaving anything, any knits hanging because gravity is going to stretch them out a bit. That's why you should never hang a knit on a hanger. Um, thankfully a mannequin is going to help keep the shape a lot nicer than something like a hanger, but gravity is still going to play a role, especially depending on what yarn you chose and how it responds to its stretch and bounce back abilities. Um, so before you do anything, I would recommend trying with just washing and blocking that sweater again, see if that fixes the issue. If it doesn't, a little crochet chain around the area where the ribbing meets the body is a great idea because it's gonna give you stability. You could also do elastic. You could even just use elastic thread. I actually haven't personally done that, but I've watched people do it and it can work really nice, but that is more for a pretty stretched out neck. So it depends on how stretched out your neck got and if, it, and if it's not bouncing back after washing. Um, but I would probably start with the crochet and see if that works. So I would go blocking, then crochet, and then you could see about the possibility of a different fix. I mean, worse comes to worse. I mean, that sweater is knit from the top down. 
You could even re-knit the collar. Um, it'll, it would just be a little tricky because you, that's your cast on edge, not your bind off edge. Um, but there is that as an option. You could even go down an extra needle size since you know you got a little bit more stretch with that yarn than you expected. All right, last question. Picking up stitches. Is there a trick to picking up the number of stitches prescribed by a pattern? For example, around a sleeve or neckband. It seems I am always trying to evenly distribute the recommended number as I go, but even when I divide the space with stitch markers, I inevitably end up with a few too many or too few, or a bunch of crowded in or overly spaced out at the end to make it work. Every time I work in an area like this, I end up picking three or four times before I get close enough to make it work. What am I doing wrong? Okay, so first I check your math, because if you are dividing so that you should so this person uh already basically said my number one recommendation for picking up stitches especially if you have to pick up a lot of stitches like if you're doing a whole button band that goes all the way around or like a shawl collar or something what i do is i take my total of number of stitches and i break that down as close as i can get depending on what the number is to a smaller stitch count anywhere between 10 and 20 stitches and that's how i place locking stitch markers all the way around so i know that in each of those sections i only have to pick up 10 stitches it is a lot easier to estimate how far apart to pick up stitches in a little tiny section than in a really really big section so my first question is is there something happening with your math when you are dividing your sections? Let's say you need to pick up 212 stitches and so you break that down by 20, but then all of a sudden what you didn't think about was those extra 12 stitches that didn't break down perfectly into that 20. And so are you all of a sudden trying to jam them into that last little section? Are you taking into consideration that when you divide it, you should have one more section than you have stitch marker you're placing? Like there's some of those little abstract things that sometimes we forget about when we're doing that math. So I would think about that. Check your math. If you are still having trouble with evenly spacing them, then that means you need to break those sections down even smaller. So maybe you were just trying to break it into quarters or 20 stitches. You might need to place that marker so you're only picking up between five and 10 stitches between each marker. You know, make it as small as you need to to remain consistent all the way around. That little bit of work in the beginning, which might take you 20 minutes or half an hour to do that math, place those markers, feel confident with that choice, but it will be so much less time than having to re-pick up stitches three to four times, especially when it's a whole bunch of stitches. Um, so those would be like my top two things is check your math and then make those sections even smaller. Um, and also another thing that I just like to throw out there for when we are picking up stitches vertically along like a horizontal fabric, such as a button band, the best rate of pickup is five to seven. So what that means is you are going to pick up and knit five stitches for every seven rows. So I like to go one, two, skip three, three, one, two, three, skip four. And that equals five out of seven. And that is how I pick up around. Um, and pay attention to, to what the pattern says. Like in some of mine, if the stitch count doesn't have to be perfect, you just need to get close to a certain number. I'll usually try to give that number to you like i'll say like oh you know this doesn't have to be exactly the however many stitches i say you just need to make sure that it fits a repeat of that it's at least four stitches plus one or something like that so that you can figure that out or some stitches like it just needs to be an odd number of stitches um so that you do have a little bit of that wiggle room but i really think making your section smaller so that you're only having to do that even over a small amount is gonna really make it easier. And I think it's really worth doing that front loaded work so that the process is smoother and more enjoyable and you don't have to redo it. 
Um, but also take solace in knowing that we have all had to redo a picked up band. I, I definitely have, um, but not nearly so much if I do that work by dividing it into smaller spaces first. All right, that is all the questions this week. I do have a little bit of show and tell. Um, we are chugging right along on our 100 day spindle challenge. Today is day, I think 57. I need to look. I started, I had, we, this started with my with my pals, my local spinning pals. Um, my friend Amy was the one who was like, I'm gonna do a 100 day spinning challenge. We were all like, we're gonna do it with you. And then we were like, we should invite everyone. So I'm not exactly on the same day as everyone else, um, but I believe the challenge should be around day 57. And I am still spindling away. I, it was so great to be able to bring, I had a work trip this past week and I brought my spindles. So I have, all kinds of spindles going. This is another project. The thing with spindles that I have realized is it becomes real easy to get a lot of different spinning projects going at once. And I'm like, okay, Andrea, focus. Cause I have got quite a few projects going. Um, but I did finish two skeins of yarn. So I thought I would show you these because they're also a lesson to me in rushing, which kind of ties back to the beginning and trying to find time for all the different things that we may love to do. Some of us are just fully concentrated on maybe one way of making one craft, one creative outlet, and that is wonderful. It must feel really good to focus all, all your energy into one place because sometimes it's hard getting distracted and wanting to do all of the things. So this was a good lesson to me to slow down. I, if, if you talk to the people that are close to me, they may tell you, and I fully admit, I tend to get a little bit obsessive and jump, jump in feet first and just go for it. And so there are so many things I want to explore in all, in all the things, sewing, weaving, spinning, knitting, everything. Um, and so it's spinning, all of a sudden there was just so much I wanted to spin that I started to rush through it. And I was doing a couple of different experiments where I was breaking down the fiber in a certain way. And so one was the skein here. And what I did for this skein is I divided the fiber into three. A third of it, I turned into a bat. The other third, I turned into roll legs. And then the final third, I kept as comb top. And I spun each to its own bobbin and then plied them together. And I actually spindle spun this. So um, I had like a dedicated spindle for each method. And then I would transfer off to these little weaving bobbins and I would put a number on them so I could keep them in order because that was important for when I plied. And this is the outcome. And it's great. It's a very pretty skein of yarn. Um, but not necessarily my favorite colors. Nothing wrong with these colors. I have an appreciation for this palette. And again, I think the yarn is quite pretty, but it's not my favorite colors. I think what I would have enjoyed more is if I had done maybe a combo spin in which I had brought in some other colors to help shift this towards kind of more of my palette. I mean, you can see, I don't mind these colors, but I love how like this then has that fun green and stuff in there to just give it like a little more depth and bring it a little more to my my palette. So this is pretty purple heavy. Uh, there's a lot of lavender. Um, I wouldn't mind if there was maybe a bit more mint or aqua kind of like in here to just help break it up. So really at the end of the day, there's nothing wrong with this. I think I just also really rushed the spin. I actually texted my spinning pals and was like, y'all, <laughs> I'm so sad about how this yarn is turning out. And thankfully they were all like, wait until you've washed it. Like do not judge that yarn until you've given it a bath and let it dry. And this is Ramboulet and it puffed up beautifully. At first I also thought I just did a really poor job spinning it because I was rushing it. I was also working with new spindles I hadn't worked for before, with before. And 
it was just a good lesson in slowing down and enjoying the spin. I feel like instead of enjoying each ply as I spun it, I was just trying to get to the end. I was just trying to get to the finish line. And the reason I spin is because I love to spin. The reason I knit is because I love to knit. Yes, I love having the sweater or the cowl at the end of it, but I do it because I love the whole process and I'm, I find so much joy in the process. So why am I rushing through all that joy to get to the end? And so I needed that reminder of, there's an, again, I'm perfectly happy with this now that it's done and I did give it a bath and I was like, okay. But I'm like, I bet I could have enjoyed it more had I just slowed down a little instead of trying to race to get done. Um, I will say, and I, I do this with knitting too, especially because pretty much everything I knit is a new design, unless I'm knitting one of my designs again, which I do a lot. But when I am knitting a new design, I'm so curious to see if it's going to work. I don't know if other designers feel this way, but for me, I never know. <laughs> or may, you know, maybe I need to work on my confidence, but I'm always like, it all feels like an experiment. And until I finish, I don't know. I don't know if it's going to turn out if what I see in my head is what will come off of my needles. I'm a very tactile, I must do it with my hands to know kind of person. And so sometimes I can rush through that process as well. And by rush, I just mean I get very focused on got to get it done instead of just slowing down and being like, oh, I love every stitch that comes off my needles. <laughs> um, okay. Here's experiment number two. So this was a very fun experiment. And again, I think that the finished yarn is totally fine, but I did not listen to my intuition on this yarn. So this is a very super fun colorway from Three Waters Farm. This one, by the way, was club colorway from Nest Fiber um, from a few years ago. So it did feel also really good to grab a bump of fiber that I had been holding onto that I wanted to use. Um, so this one, I specifically actually bought to do this little experiment. And what I did was I divided this in half and half of it got turned into a bat where I blended all the colors together. And then half I spun top to bottom. So there was a couple of different things that was going on with this one. Um, you can see how it's more muted thanks to the bat that it got spun with. And I love that. To be honest, I almost wish I had made the whole thing into a bat because the nuance of all these different colors, you can, you can see there's orange and yellow and like turquoise, sage, blue, um, that once they all got blended together, created basically a heathered kind of beige-ish brown fiber, but it was so beautiful because it was so nuanced. Um, but one of the things is I tend to pick, if I'm picking a braid, I often go with color and fiber content is secondary to me. Now I'm sure there are spinners out there gasping, <laughs> but I can't help it. I love color and that can sway my decision process. So this had a hefty amount of silk in it. It is a Polworth silk blend. And it had at least 20% silk. Yeah, it was 80% Polworth, 20% silk. And I realized I do not love spinning silk. I'm fine if it's blended into something or if it has a purpose like Surrey silk to create little tweety bits. But if it's just kind of, you've seen them probably in braids, bats and stuff like that, where it's like strips of, you can see the silk, it's really shiny. I feel like I battle that when I spin it and it can be a dry sucker for me. I do not like feeling like I'm struggling trying to spin that silk, especially because it's with something else. So this is with Polworth as a much shorter staple length than the silk that was in here is left long. And then you've got this shorter staple of Polworth. And so you can't really draft them the same. And I feel like I, it adds stress to my hands. I'm kind of battling it. Um, so it was a good reminder to pay attention to what fiber I really want to spin and not letting my my color lust over like make my decisions for me when I'm like, oh, but that braid's so pretty. <laughs> um, so paying attention to that fiber content. And so here, but here's, here's the real thing I learned. I knew 
I had decided to make this a two ply because I wanted to go a little thicker. I wanted to spin it a little thicker, but I knew as I was starting the spin, I was like, I should really divide the part that I kept as a braid. I was like, I should really divide that in half and not just spin it end to end as it is now. A, I don't like spinning across the top of a large, like a wider thing of fiber. So even this guy, like I don't want to spin across the top of this back and forth. I don't love doing that. And B, what happened with the color repeats in this one meant that I have some really big color repeats. So there's a lot of yellow and then a lot of orange and then a lot of like the blue in there. And I ignored that little voice in my head because I just wanted to jump in. I just wanted to start spinning. And I just wanted to be done with the spin so I could see what would happen. And I knew the minute I was plying, I knew. I was like, I should have taken more time to truly decide how I wanted this to turn out. Ideally, I think I actually would have preferred a three ply yarn. And I would have liked if I had done two plies of the braid and one ply of the bat so that these colors that the, so that the solid ply that just as the color changes happening that wasn't turned into the bat that they could have kind of crossed over each other and added more nuance almost like a zoomed in amped up version of the nuance that's happening in that bat so all in all it was such a good experiment i'm very very curious to knit this up to see what I'm going to think of the clarinet up because that changes it so much than when it's just in a skein. And I will say as much as I didn't love fiddling with the silk, I do think that the finished yarn is pretty darn delightful and plumpy and really lovely on the hand. Um, so yeah. It's so fun. It's so fun to explore. And this is one of the reasons why I also think it's important to try and do a little like knitting journal, spinning, sewing, all of those things to take notes and to have a moment of reflection and be like, okay, what do I love about this? What would I change about the future? What did I learn? How can I apply what I learned to something else? And yeah, it's just fun. It's fun to, to dive in there. So anyways, I guess that's all I got. I just went on a little bit of a ramble. So thanks for coming along on, on the adventure with me. Um, I am going to get back to work up here. I've got some fun things I'm working on. I can't wait to bring you some more patterns uh, in these coming months. We already have the next couple lined up and ready to go. So, and I just want to say I am so tickled I know I've said it here before, but there are fewer greater compliments to a designer than people, A, casting on a new design the day it comes out. I saw so many people casting on Traveler Cowls the day it went out. And that just made me so happy because I was really trying to put a pattern out there where you could dive right into whatever yarn you've got, or run to your local yarn store, whatever it may be, sit down at your real plan your spinning project for it. But I love that so many of you dove right into what you had and cast on. Um, and I have seen so many people already knitting more than one. And that is like, oh my goodness. I have met people who've knit like the shift cowl 11 times. And I'm like, that just makes my heart sing because I think that that is something I would love to see more of in the knitting community. I see so, so is to it all the time. Like, again, I have made so many pairs of these berry pants. Like we find a sewing pattern we love and then we play with it and we use all these different fabrics and we kind of see what else we can do with that pattern. Um, and I just, I love when I do get to see that mirrored in the knitting community because we have these great patterns and let's continue to celebrate them. Um, so when you choose to knit one of my patterns more than once, I'm just like, oh, you like it. You really like it. Um, okay. I'm going to end this here. I hope that you have a lovely weekend and that you get to make something, whatever it is, from muffins to yarn to knitting to memories. I hope that you have just a lovely weekend. I so appreciate getting to spend some of your time with you and I hope to see you back here next week. If you enjoy this space, please feel free to hit that subscribe and like button. It does help us on here to be able to continue to create these little videos every week and happy knitting. Bye.